Good morning, everyone. How are you? Happy Friday. This is our final fine tuned Friday of the semester. We've had some really good sessions and today is not going to be any different. We have a great session for you today and we're going to talk to you about how to fine tune your knowledge of an employee contract. And so uh, I have my colleagues on board here, Nicole Ashton and Becca Smouse. I have our presenter, uh, John Meisner, and I'll introduce him in a bit here. Um, but I just want to just, uh, you know, let you know that uh, this is a journey, okay? And I'm going to screen, a sh I'm, I'm going to share a screen here, if you don't mind, before I introduce John. Let's just see here. Sorry. Can you guys see this? So the journey from the start to the beginning. Now, you know, typically you're saying, well, doesn't the journey start and then doesn't it end? Well, not really, you know, cause you, you guys started here and then, uh, you know, you had your classroom education and then you, you know, you got your experience through campus media perhaps, maybe you're in one of our immersion programs, like a professional program, the PR lab, Cronkite News, the Sports Bureau, whatever it might be. You're getting experience through your internships during your time here. Also, along the way, along this little journey um, at, at Cronkite, you are building professional relationships. At least you should be building professional relationships and building up that professional network because that's probably the best way you're gonna find a job, right? And then also too, uh, you're preparing your portfolio, you're building your skills, you're building your relationships, you're building that network, you're, you're learning and you're trying new things. And then all these work samples are going into this nicely produced professional looking portfolio. And you're preparing your resume, you're preparing a cover letter perhaps. Um, and all this is for that, for that goal of marketing yourself for that job, for that first job. Also along the way, uh, you're meeting with recruiters. And so I'm gonna skip here mm -hmm. to, the, to the recruiters. And these are some of the recruiters that we typically deal with. And this is more on, along the broadcast side when these broadcast groups like a Tegna comes in and they wanna interv interview some of our soon to be graduates. But I'm just gonna just spend maybe 30 seconds on each one and let you know what, what they are looking for. So Tegna, uh, great company. Uh, I can tell you that their values and missions, you know, they, they are very inclusive. They, um, they value diversity uh, and they own many properties in the United States. Uh, Scripps, uh, EW Scripps company, they own ABC uh, 15 in town and Tegna owns channel 12 in town. Um, Scripps is a good company. Sinclair Broadcast Group, they are a large group. Um, they have, a, a, you know, a certain viewpoint. Um, and, you know, as the title says, you know, it pays to do your research. So all these companies that, that like to come here and interview our students, our soon-to-be graduates, uh, please do your research on them. So when Tegna comes in, Scripps comes in, Sinclair comes in, Please do your research ahead of time, know their mission statements, know their values, look at their um, company cultures, that type of thing. And then also too, I would suggest that maybe you pick up the phone or you email someone that you might know. And I can connect you with people that work at some of these companies and you can just talk to them. I mean, they are working at these groups and that's a good way to get some information as part of your research. News Press and Gazette, uh, they're a smaller family-owned company. Uh, Morgan Murphy, again, smaller family-owned company. Quincy's a, uh, a smaller company as well. Nexstar is the largest at this at this time. Um, they probably have 190 something stations and over 100 markets in the U in the U.S. Spectrum is uh, it's called Charter Spectrum. It's a cable cable group, and they are regional. And then we also deal with networks, NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC, and CNN. So again, do your research on the companies um, and they can, um, you know, gives you a better 
um, opportunity to make a, a better decision. I'm gonna go back to one more slide here. So th that's part of the meeting the, re the recruiters part, okay, right in here. And then after you meet with those recruiters, as I said, you gotta do that research. And then once you meet with them, once you get those interviews, then all of a sudden here come the job offers, right? And then if you're on, on the TV side or the broadcast side of things, especially if you're gonna be on air or maybe a producer, typically you're gonna get a contract, okay? If, if they want you to work at their company, the contract is gonna be uh, part of that process. And I can tell you, it's the last step of the process. And today we are going to, um, sorry about that. Let me stop the screen share. Today we are going to uh, talk specifically about the contract. And we have a really good person, an expert in contracts. It's John Meisner. John is on our faculty. He is the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship for Journalism Professor of Practice. He's also a senior advisor for Arizona PBS and a senior advisor for the ASU Foundation. Now, before his role with ASU and the Cronkite School, Mr. Meisner uh, was the president and general manager for Tegna, uh, KPNX TV, a Tegna property, Channel 12 News. I did that for about 14, 15 years. Uh, he was also the COO, the chief operating officer of Gannett's combined television, print, and digital operation, uh, Republic Media, for about four or five years. So with that, yeah, there, there he is. Uh, John. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, great that you're all here on a, on a Friday. And uh, I know that, um, that uh, being presented a contract can be a real scary thing. Um, and I'm here to make it less scary for all of you because the, the flip side is it should be thrilling because it's the, it's evidence that a company is willing to part ways with their money and trade it for your time and your expertise. So, uh, as Mike has, uh, so eloquently stated, uh, it is the, uh, the beginning of a career and, uh, Companies, of course, want to run good businesses and make sound decisions. So uh, at some point, uh, a contract shows up. And uh, let's, let's go through some slides here. And I will, I'll say this, I'd like to go through the deck uh, in its entirety and then take questions. But as you have questions, please put them in chat. And then uh, Mike and uh, Nicole are going to monitor those. And then we will... Uh, will uh, answer those questions. And then I'll also uh, give you my email if you wanna get into specific uh, questions um, about uh, offers that you may or may not have or, 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 or are interested in having. Okay, so uh, I can share my screen, right, Mike? Yeah, yes, you, you may, yes. Okay, so let me, let me do that. Go back to Zoom and I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna go to the there and there. There you go, we see it. Right. Good, perfect. All right, fine tune your knowledge of an employee contract. So let's talk about what a contract is. Um, generally, it's the last step in the hiring process and negotiation process. It's a legally binding document that expresses the agreement that you have made by the hiring manager, whether that's at a PR firm or, or a television station or, or any media entity. It's there uh, partially, not only to express in writing what everybody thinks they've agreed to, but it also gives the employer and the employee legal recourse if either party breaches the contract. Uh, so it, it, it works to defend both of you should, should bad things happen. Um, there's similar wording across the groups and across the country, but employment law does vary by state. And so you may see some nuances even with the same company, depending on the market that, uh, that you're, you're in or see that you're in. And I keep saying market because I'm a TV guy and, and uh, eventually I was into uh, print and, and digital, but I tend to say market. And my bit of advice is approach signing a contract very seriously because they are, uh, 
binding and enforceable in a wonderful way to ruin your reputation and probably get sued is to breach a contract. So uh, don't cite it until you completely understand it and, uh, and you agree with, with all the different terms. Um, typically, well, we talk about the contract, but typically you'll end up with three documents. Uh, one is the offer letter. And, and if I, let me just speak through a lens of, of broadcast, uh, broadcasting. So when my uh, executive producer or news director would come to me with a hiring recommendation, uh, she or he would present me with an offer letter or a term sheet. Say for example, um, uh, we are, we'd like to hire this person as an MMJ. Here's what she has agreed to do in terms of the assignment and, uh, and the potential pay either by the hour or salary. Uh, here's her start date. Here's what I'd like to offer in terms of a relocation bonus, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would approve uh, th that offer. Eventually that, and that would often be sent to the new employee or the prospective employee um, for a little back and forth in terms of understanding what it all, what it all means. Uh, the contract then, which is often titled a talent employment agreement uh, is the second part. I'm gonna show you another slide on that. And that's, uh, those are multi-page uh, uh, elements of, a, of an agreement. And then there's often a, uh, a benefit summary. So the contract uh, often reflects this, what we call the boilerplate or standard language. And these are pretty standard in the industry, um, covering topics such as ownership of work products. So any work, any work that you create uh, is owned by the company and not by you. Um, conditions for termination uh, are, are spelled out. And uh, in addition to, uh, you know, just, what we all know is bad behavior might be, you know, anything related to social media or working a second job uh, without permission, that kind of stuff that is uh, spelled out in a uh, notice of renewal, which I'm gonna to get to into more detail in a minute, and then many other clauses. Often the boilerplate is non-negotiable. Um, no matter who you are, the company, uh, it, it, those, those terms have withstood all sorts of questions and generally they will not talk about removing any of those, those clauses. Of course, there could be a first time, but uh, generally non-negotiable. Um, and then the next is uh, a benefit summary. Uh, one of the companies I know has a little trifold brochure that they give to prospects, uh, prospective employees. And it will include things such as vacation days, sick days, personal days, PTO or paid time off. They all have different uh, wording for these things. Uh, 401k uh, benefits. Uh, and that's, 401k is a big darn deal. You know, you can accumulate a lot of wealth if at, at your young ages, you begin to take advantage of tax deferred matching programs in a lot of these companies. Have, and that's, that's something to be, it could be a deal breaker. In fact, if you're looking at two different offers and one matches maybe 50% of your salary and the other matches none or 10%, that's something to pay attention to. Health insurance is certainly uh, important if you're over the age of 26 and, and uh, therefore can't be on your parents' uh, insurance anymore, don't have anything else. What are the company holidays and what other kind of perks do they have, including tuition reimbursement. At my prior company, we had a tuition reimbursement plan. Uh, not everybody uh, applied for it or was approved for it, but generally if they had a good reason to uh, take a class or go back to school, we would help them with that. And that's, that's really important to look at. Uh, they really vary by company. So it's really important to, uh, to think about this, even more so sometimes than, you know, a, 50 cent per hour difference if they're paying you hourly or even a few thousand dollars annually uh, if the benefits are not, not good. So those are the three documents. Um, as Mike kind of touched on, uh, you know, this is the, the beginning you know, of your future, your professional future. And a terrific approach is to make sure you have the skills 
that employers desire. And I know that our career services department does a terrific job in terms of counseling you and in, in terms of what classes to take, um, what internships to solicit and how to be absolutely ready with an impressive uh, resume. Then also, as Mike touched on, uh, creating a network of support through internships, mentors, faculty members, and this gigantic Cronkite alumni network that we have. Uh, just don't, don't overlook any of these approaches. And then in terms of negotiating the best agreement, it's always best to have more than one option. And that seems very, um, very elementary. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is, particularly if you have limited your, your uh, self-marketing, you may get a, a dialogue going with a, with a potential employer and it's your only option. Now, it may turn out that that is your best option, but you have little leverage in terms of negotiating either an annual salary or, or, uh, or hourly uh, pay if you only have one option. Uh, the other point I will make is never bluff, never pretend that you, uh, that you have other options because they may call your bluff and then when you don't end up where you said you might end up, uh, they may know about that and, and you probably won't ever have another opportunity to work uh, for that company. So have lots of options. Uh, we, I worked with one student last May who had two options and he used it very wisely not in an arrogant way, but just uh, in terms of with both potential employers pointing out that if they're one of two, he's, he was very interested in working for uh, each of them or both of them, uh, but he had to compare and contrast the options that he, that he had. And ultimately he was able to negotiate a, a better deal in terms of income and uh, assignment than he would have if he had not been able to truthfully refer to another option that he was considering. Um, it's not only about the money, uh, and as Mike said, do your research, but stations, PR firms, whoever you're talking with for, as a prospective employer, they have reputations. And you know these days, of course, you can look at websites like LinkedIn and Glassdoor and, and others, and then work your network of friends and potential friends and just other Cronkite grads and uh, ASU grads to find out what that, that employer is really like. Um, for example, you know, what is their brand? If it's, if it's a television station, what are their ratings? There's not a direct benefit between a high rated station and a great culture but success doesn't happen accidentally. And uh, top rated stations didn't just stumble into being a top rated station. Often they have the culture, the discipline, the investment in people, they have progression plans in place to move people up uh, through departments and, and to other stations. There's a reason that they're a top station in the market. That does not mean, and I've worked for top stations and, and, and the opposite of top stations. I had great experience at both, but it's really, uh, it's really different. And sometimes it's great to work for the, the lowest rated station, particularly if they're looking at a turnaround and you can be part of their, of their future success. And that's something you can, that you can brag about. Uh, and then look at their fit with recent college graduates. Um, the, the, the boss, the person you're gonna work for how is she or he uh, uh, equipped and, and personality wise at working with somebody in their 20s who has their first professional job and, uh, and needs more, uh, more guidance uh, than, uh, than a veteran does? That's a really important thing to understand who you're going to, uh, to report to and or in, in your conversations, take a look at of other recent graduates they've hired, how successful have they been? And what did they end up doing? Did they move up to that station? Uh, or did they go elsewhere? You know, what, what, what happened? Uh, you're gonna wanna be really clear because at a certain point, you'll be packing up, uh, I'll just refer to, to, to my oldest son. You know, we packed up a U-Haul and drove a long way and that was his new life. And uh, he had signed an agreement and uh, he was there for a couple of years. So you need to have all these kind of conversations with yourself and people you, you trust before you, you do that. And then um, 
can you live in the city that, that can you really live in the city you're going to? Um, there are some wonderful places to live and some dreadful places to live if you're, if you're a young person. And when you make a commitment, you are making a commitment. I, I strongly encourage uh, every candidate to, uh, to visit the, the, the company, whether it's a PR firm or a broadcast company, walk around, be observant, ask questions, walk around the city and the community, read about it, and then ask yourself uh, uh, honestly, or would you like living there for two or three years? I also wanna to mention too, you know, there's a tendency sometimes to say, I'm gonna go work my first market and then get the heck out of there. Uh, you can create a wonderful career for yourself in smaller and, and middle markets. So um, th this notion of kind of uh, moving on quickly, I don't think, that is necessarily the right thing to do. You know, there's a reason some of these broadcast companies have so many stations and so many markets. Some of them are in very small communities and middle communities, and you can create quite a life uh, for yourself there. So that's just something to, to think about. Um, let's talk about what you can negotiate. Uh, first thing is, is your salary. And sometimes people say, well, how much is, how much room is there in the number that they're offering me? There is, there's no such thing as a, as a you know, clarity on what that is because some hiring managers will offer you the absolute maximum that they are authorized to offer you is approved generally by their boss. And in my case, it was the general manager. Um, or there may be some room in it. I don't know, it might be 10%, it might be 20%, it might be 30%. I don't know what that number is, but at a certain point, and I'll talk about this a little later, um, it's, it's uh, important to get to their, uh, their, their best number so you can make an informed decision. There's something called uh, exempt and non-exempt status. I'm gonna cover that in the next slide. It has to do with overtime. Uh, the third uh, element you can negotiate is the term. And what we see a lot is two or three year terms. Um, as a general manager, I did not like hiring people on a two year basis because as soon as I was into you know, eight months already, we were talking about the next agreement. So my preference was three years and you're gonna see a lot of three year uh, offers out there. Um, how about a signing bonus or a relocation bonus? Sometimes they're the same thing. They just call them uh, different, different terms. Um, that will help you uh, not lose money by traveling across the country. Uh, sometimes they'll, it'll be a flat fee. We've seen numbers ranging from uh, $500 to $2,000 to help with relocation and, and uh, you know, staying in a motel or an apartment for the first month, that kind of thing. Uh, I think a lot of good employers are, I know a lot of good employers are offering those now because it is competitive in hiring uh, good people. And the, the beauty here is you're graduating from a top school, top university and top journalism and mass comm school. And your, rep, your reputation is preceded by the school's reputation. So uh, the school's brand is helpful to you. Clothing allowances, um, they're, not, they're not that common these days. Uh, my old company got rid of them a long time ago and we, we would negotiate you know, primarily on the, on, on the pay. Uh, and then again, I talked about tuition and educational opportunities. And it's kind of an interesting dynamic that happens if you ask about this, it signals that you are interested in, in lifelong learning and improving yourself. And uh, so not only may you, may you uh, negotiate in something like this, but I think it's a good signal to an employer that you are very, um, very uh, uh, ambitious. Uh, the other element is, another element is a first right of renewal and refusal, which I'm gonna cover in a minute, because this can really bite you if, if, uh, if you're not careful, and then outs to leave the market. How are we doing, Mike? Or are we getting questions in chat? I'm not even looking. Uh, we have a couple in the okay. chat. Good, okay. I'll keep rolling. I have a few more slides and we'll spend some time together answering questions and, and talking. 
So uh, these are very important clauses and definitions. And the first is exempt and non-exempt, and they, they read backwards. You would think it's better to be exempt, but it's not. It's better to be non-exempt. So exempt means you don't get paid any overtime for the hours that you work over 40 hours a week. And this, this tends to apply to, to employees who are on their second or third jobs because a employment law um, often delineates between these two. And if, if you're exempt, it means you're kind of a, a, in a higher position and you are self-directed. Uh, it's a little squishy, but that's basically what it, what it means. Non-exempt means you will be paid overtime for hours worked in excess of 40 hours in a week. And a lot of time, if we're talking about broadcast, if you are, um, if you're an MMJ, a reporter, a photog, you will often work more than 40 hours a week. And, and that is a wonderful thing for, for your income. And for those of you who are in Stratcom, PR, et cetera, you may be on the an exempt uh, status because you may be very self-directed and not hourly, it just depends. Um, so you'll have to determine that. Um, and as you're interviewing, it's really important to understand is a company, is their culture so healthy that they, um, they understand work-life balance or are they gonna grind you to the bone and not pay you extra for every hour over 40 hours a week. It's, uh, you know, business, business is, uh, is a battle. And if you, if you go, to, go to work for, for a company that just expects you to donate a lot of your time and not get paid for it, uh, I, I, I would just caution you to not, to not do that. Or go in with eyes wide open and make sure that the salary is high enough that you are totally fine with working 60 hours a week, then it's a moot, a moot point. Uh, the next clause is the first right of refusal renewal. Uh, and, uh, again, this one can really hurt you if you don't go in with, with eyes open. There, um, the company or this clause gives the company the right to hold on to you even if you wanna leave. And it's very difficult to extricate yourself out of this. Um, the most burdensome one I have seen is one that applies not only to the market that the employee was going to, prospective employee going to, but it applied to every other market that that company uh, operated a television station in. So essentially it was uh, almost a lifelong commitment to work for this company. You know, say for example, you're in city A and you've had a wonderful time with them but you want to go to city B and they own and operate a station there, but you want to work for another station, you would not be allowed to go work for another station. So it is very limiting. The wonderful thing is that, uh, and these often show up on a term sheet rather than the talent agreement. Um, the wonderful thing is they will generally take this out of the agreement if you, if you, uh, bring it to their attention. If you don't bring it to their attention, they will they'll keep it in there and you'll sign it and you have just cost yourself um, a lot of freedom. So I would be very uh, cautious of this. Now, the in-market ones, um, those, those tend to stay. And I want to delineate the, the multiple market ones will often come out. Um, the in-market ones are very difficult to negotiate out. And, and just speaking from a general manager standpoint, the last thing I wanted to do was hire somebody, bring them into the market, promote them heavily, um, and then have a competitor be able to capitalize on their popularity, their brand, their social media following. So uh, it's a way for smart companies to play uh, defense. So it, it's, I don't, what you don't see happen very often is somebody moving within the same market because of these, of these protections. Um, the outs, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, enables you to leave a station before the end date of the agreement. And often uh, new hires will ask for say a top 30 out or 
or say they're moving to the East Coast for their first job and they want, they would like to be able to go back to the West Coast if something opens up. Uh, these are difficult, but not impossible to get. I think it also um, signals to the employer that maybe your heart is not into doing a great job with them, uh, that your eye is on the door. And I think it, my opinion, personal opinion, is that it weakens your negotiating uh, position because uh, on the one hand, you're asking them to invest in you and, and give you a lot of uh, opportunity and guidance as a, as a new employee, new in the business. And at the same time, you're asking them to give you the ability to leave whenever you want. Um, but if it's important to you, um, ask for it, be specific, explain why, that kind of thing. And, uh, I've seen I've seen companies give these recently, but uh, it's important to have a, a pretty darn good reason for putting putting that in there. Um, we'll go to questions now in, in chat, and then uh, if there are additional questions, here's my email, and of course you can find me on uh, ASU's uh, email list. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. I'm going to stop sharing, and then we will go to uh, to questions and uh, see what I can do. Thank you, John. That's sure. great, great information. I, we do have a uh, question in the chat. Okay. Uh, looks like, how do you resign if you are under contract? Um, so who asked that? Uh, the name is Daily Bostic. Uh, who, so go ahead and ask if you're still on the, oh, there you are. Yeah, so are you are you speaking about breaking the contract or giving notice to leave after the employment date is over? I guess both on both sides to um, leave when it's over or to um, say something happened in the workplace um, environment just to be able to leave under um, the conditions. Yeah. So if it's, if a, that's, that's a good question. If, if there's a grievance you know, say harassment or something. Um, the first step is to is to go to your boss, or if the boss is the harasser or or does not um, is not helpful, then uh, then you go to an HR director, either on the local local side, or a lot of companies have um, um, corporate HR people with hotlines, so that you can. Um, you can contact them with a grievance. Unless you have an employee, a grievance like that, I wouldn't recommend uh, breaking a contract. Uh, that, can be, uh, that can be a bad thing, but you have every um, opportunity uh, and responsibility to, uh, to bring something you know, like harassment to somebody's attention so that uh, they leave, you don't have to leave. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then if you want to talk more about that situation, just email me and we can have a private discussion about it. And then uh, someone had another question about how um, does the pandemic kind of affect contracts, if at all? Well, you know, the question is, yeah, or the answer is, it, it depends. So I'll give you an example. Um, most broadcasters, most companies have done an incredible job at universities pivoting for the pandemic in terms of being able to work remotely, whether it's teaching at the Cronkite School, whether it is being an MMJ for a local television station, whether working remotely for a PR firm. Um, I think we've all discovered uh, how flexible we can be. Uh, you know, we, we have done things in the television business and I was associated with Arizona PBS too that we would have never imagined doing. I mean, just to, I know a local affiliate here where they have a staff of, of 175 people and they only have maybe 20 coming, coming in each day. So. The majority is working remotely and they are doing just fine. Uh, so in that case, there would not be um, 
there would not be uh, probably any understanding for anybody breaking their contract. On the other hand, because some companies have um, suffered significant revenue loss, uh, and I'm, I didn't know exactly the, 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 the context of the question, they may, they may be very happy to have some resignation so they can lower their payroll expenses too. So uh, what you want to do may be, uh, may thrill them because they're trying to uh, cut expenses too. Uh, but, you, you know, when does this all start? February? We're still learning new things. And uh, so I can't give any ironclad answer in terms of what they would or not do. I guess the top line would be uh, companies would expect the employees to um, honor the contract just as the employer intends to do for the employee. Does that make sense, uh, Cassidy? Okay, thank you. So um, what is not in chat? Are there other questions anybody has? Everybody I've, clear on exempt and not exempt? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I have a question. So, you know, you talk about tuition reimbursement, which yep. is great. So what happens if somebody who's interested in weather meteorology and they ask the station to help them pay for that meteorology degree or that continuing education does yeah. the station come back and say okay we'll help you pay for it but you have to give us another year or two after you get that meteorological degree does that happen it does happen it does happen and i uh, i had an employee who was attending um what was it mississippi state that does the meteorology and, and we we reimbursed her you know every semester um, and at a certain point, you know, we, we want to hang on to, to good people. So, um, you know, she was happy. We were happy. Um, it, all, it all worked out. Uh, and and it, it, it's a competitive process, too, because uh, at my station, we had a limited funding for that. So we really had to understand what the intention was uh, for the tuition reimbursement. And, and we tended to we approve them more often when the classes and the curriculum were related to, to news broadcasting, not something completely different. Yeah. All right, don't be shy, chat or just turn on your mic or, or, uh, or camera. Anybody? Um, regarding meteorologists, um, do you guys um, fund when what what's really the contract? I guess safety reasoning when um, someone has to go out during the weather. Um, does the contract specific? Um, is it very specific in in those when you have to do with weather such as hurricanes and snowstorms and blizzards? Yeah, you, you mean do. Well, I don't think it's a, it's not a contractual thing. It's more of, um, I can't, when Mike gave, a, gave that list of companies, I can't think of any of those companies who would dispatch any employee into harm's way. Um, I think that's just uh, smart and moral. I'm just like in harm's way, just as something just happens, does, um, I guess, and cover, like covering, um, I know Arizona has a law. I um, I believe I have to double check with Arizona law that employees have to ensure just in case work like workers comp. All yeah, all employees are are insured under workers comp. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me an ex in a, another example? I'm, I'm just thinking of a scenario like say that um, uh, someone goes out and it's raining and the car happens to just get stuck and the, the rain just starts picking up more and more um, and so that a flood basically starts happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the, the employee has a responsibility to keep themselves 
safe and the employer has a, a, a obligation not to dispatch crews in the same way, you know, during the selection cycle too, we were at PBS and, and all the local stations, uh, we spent a lot of time and attention making sure that our crews were, were safe out on the streets of uh, Phoenix. So I think it's uh, analogous to that too. But if, uh, if something bad happens, and I had this happen several times at, at 12 News, um, just, you know, just by virtue of the number of hours that people are out there, you know, we, we had uh, reporters and photographers involved in car accidents and there were legal remedies and lawsuits and all, all that kind of stuff too. Uh, but that's less about contracts. I hope that um, answers your question. I mean, this just brought up regarding contracts. Who are the contracts uh, um, generally made to when you have to do special events such as the Olympics, the White House, going to the White House? Um, are there contracts dealing with those? Do people, are those made with the, the journalist? Um, or is that like anyone when it comes to like NDRs or non-disclosure agreements? Are those made with the company or is that made with the journalist? So let's unpack that a little bit. So if you have a, a contract as a reporter or correspondent and you are dispatched to cover the White House, that's covered in your, in your agreement. Uh, if there are um, non-disclosure agreements regarding you know, some visits, some assignment, typically the reporter would work with news management at the station and a station attorney to, to execute the agreement. Does that work for you? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Who else? I see a lot of squares here. Everybody good on exempt and non-exempt and all that stuff? Okay, Mike, anything to add? Um, not right now. How about Nicole or Becca? Do you have any questions? I'll ask a question, John. So this is a little bit past the contract. Maybe you've been in the job for a little while and, you know, maybe this is for someone who's not under contract. Maybe you're just working as a reporter. Sure. How do you ask for a raise? What, how does that conversation go? <laughs> Uh, I've been in hundreds of those conversations. Um, I think it's really important and it's amazing to me how, how companies often don't follow this discipline, but um, you know, there, generally there are annual reviews, but um, an employee should never be surprised by um, how their boss thinks they're doing. Uh, it should be an ongoing dialogue. Uh, and if you have that conversation going, you're very, you should be very clear on if you're fulfilling the company's expectations and if you are, um, that you are well regarded. Uh, some companies use what's called forced ranking. And, and I'll just explain it for those of you who don't know what that is. But say, for example, every quarter, financial quarter every year, uh, management is asked to, um, to list in priority order the top performer to the lowest performer and group them say in top 10, middle 70, bottom 20 or top 20%, middle 70, bottle bottom 10. All of you, because you're Cronkite grads or will soon be, you wanna be in that top 20. Um, um, you, you, want, you want the company to be thrilled that you're working for them and they want you to be disappointed if you, uh, if you start looking elsewhere. So when you have that kind of relationship in your, uh, and reputation, it makes it pretty easy to ask for a meeting, ask for some feedback. Uh, they'll pretty soon, they'll, they'll quickly deduce likely what your, what your goal is in that meeting. <laughs> and then, uh, 
I think it, a, a good way to, um, to, um, to approach it is to, uh, to, to ask, you know, out of all the employees in the, in, in the company, how, how do you compare? Uh, are they happy with your work? And, uh, and then ask if uh, they think you're being paid fairly, and the key word is fair, fairly for what you're, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, because just because you signed a contract two years ago, doesn't mean that there isn't flex in, in what they may be able to pay you. And um, from what I understand, uh, men are more comfortable asking that question than women are. And um, I would encourage everybody to be comfortable with that if, you're, if your work is, is high caliber. I do wanna cover one more thing. And uh, say that you've got the offer in front of you and you really want to uh, accept you know, offer A, and there's offer B, and you're just curious about whether that number can go up more, one of the most powerful things you can say is, uh, thank you so much in, in, for believing in me. Thank you so much. Um, I really want to make this work. As you know, I'm also talking with another PR firm, TV station, whatever. Uh, so what I need to know is, is this your, and this is key, is this your best and final offer? Those words, is this your best and final offer? And sometimes that will prompt the hiring manager to, um, to think about it and maybe come up with, with a little more, a little more. So I hope that answers your, your question. And you say it in a, respectful, positive way, conveying how interested you are in working for them because you are, you wouldn't have gone this far through the conversation if you weren't, but you're very interested in, in being paid the highest number possible. And for that, you will be a wonderful employee. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. That was awesome. Great information. Sure, thank you, you're welcome. I have a question. Okay. Um, so I'm pretty early in my Cronkite journey. I'm a sophomore. Okay. Uh, so from my understanding, the contracts we're talking about are for full-time positions at different stations. But I also know that's not what everyone's path looks like throughout journalism. Right. Uh, so let's say you are working freelance and you're writing for somewhere. How do those contracts look? Um, I've only seen a couple of those. So I can't speak with great authority, but what I do know is a lot of times they have to do with um, the hours that you're devoting to that project versus another one. So um, say you're writing for one public, say you're writing for two publications. They both, they both want you to write for them. Um, it's important for you to know how many hours each week or each month, each one would require to, you to uh, devote and then speak to that to both publications. So you may say, even before you're ready, good for you to be a sophomore on this call. You know, it's, it's good that you're, that you're early in the conversation, but let them know, yeah, I can, you know, I'm going to school full time, but, and I have about 20 hours to work um, and I'm committed to 10 hours a week to this employer. And I'd be happy to give you 10 hours. So let's talk about, um, what's fair and most people most companies want to be fair fair is a really powerful word um, even if you don't know uh, the budgets that they have if you ask to be paid fairly for your work most good companies will respond in a, in a good way to that does that answer your question about project work project agreements yeah it was helpful i wasn't sure if it was hour based or what so that was great thank you well, it, it, it can be, uh, some of them are, um, you know, we'll pay you a thousand dollars to do this. And then what is helpful is for you to back into the hourly rate based on what the prospective employer and you estimate the time is, time, the necessary time is to complete the project. You can do that too. Yeah, two ways to do it. And, and the, 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 the 
consequence is the same. It's just a matter of semantics in terms of how it's set up. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Also in a, in a future uh, fine-tuned Friday, probably in the new year, uh, Cassidy, we'll, we'll probably have a special uh, fine-tuned Friday devoted to freelancing. Very cool, thank you. Anything to add to that, Mike, to my answer? No, I think, um, Cassidy, uh, for your uh, freelance projects, is it a per word, per story uh, payment, or is it a per project type of compensation? I'm not doing anything now. It was just oh. something I was curious about. Okay. Because, yeah, so when we get into that freelance more in depth, uh, we'll talk about project based freelancing, per word freelancing, that type of thing. But John, you covered it. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. All right, what about the other um, 20 squares I see here? And by the way, if you're shy, you might be in the wrong business. <laughs> it's important to advocate for yourself and ask questions. All right, well, uh, again, uh, feel free to email me with any individual or private things you wanna talk about a potential, potential employers and jobs. I'm glad you all were uh, able to spend time with us uh, today. Mike, thanks for being a great MC. We'll have to do this again in spring semester. <laughs> thanks, John, appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for all the helpful information. Oh, thanks to my colleagues, Becca and Nicole. Thank yeah. you for being here on, on another edition of Fine Tune Friday. Sure. We hope to see you next semester for Fine Tune Fridays as well. Mr. John Meisner, let's give that virtual round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We appreciate it. And good luck to all of you in your, uh, in your careers. And uh, you picked a great school and I know you'll have a lot of professional success. All right, see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.